This is TTT Live. I'm DK Rostar. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to the Manager, Corporate Communications at the Ministry of Health, Candice Alcantara. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to the Ministry of Health's virtual media conference on the national COVID-19 response. I'm pleased to introduce this morning Dr. Miriam Abdul-Richards, Principal Medical Officer Institutions, and Dr. Brian Amor, CEO of the Southwest Regional Health Authority. I'm Candice Alcantara, Manager Corporate Communication at the Ministry of Health, and I will be your moderator this morning. We begin with Dr. Richards, who will give us the clinical update and brief information on the parallel healthcare system. Thank you very much, Ms. Alcantara. Good morning to my colleague, Dr. Brian Amo, CEO of the Southwest Regional Health Authority. Good morning to all members of the media. Thank you ever so much for your continued presence and attendance at our media conferences, uh, both on Mondays and Wednesdays, and as well as on Saturdays when we do a conference with the Honorable Prime Minister. Um, to the listening and viewing population of Trinidad and Tobago, good morning to everyone. Uh, this morning, I'd like to start by providing a brief update on the clinical um, information in the parallel healthcare system, as well as the media release. But before I start, it would be remiss of me if I did not pause for a moment and thank every single frontline healthcare worker and other frontline healthcare worker, workers, uh, for example, persons at the Ministry of National Security, the TTPS, the TTDF, all our private sector partners who have been assisting us in the vaccination drive, um, the private sector agencies, and all other persons who continue to give selfless service to the national response to COVID-19. Um, so thank you once again, everyone. This morning, I'd like to present the information as per media release 770, which is accurate as of 4 p.m. on June 29th, 2021. Uh, at present, there are 24,518 total recovered patients with COVID-19. Um, yesterday, we confirmed an additional 185 positive cases, which increased the total number of active positive cases to 7,177. These active case these active cases are between home isolation where we where there are 604 6464 6, persons who are being managed through the offices of the respective county medical officers of health and their physicians as well as 389 patients in hospital and 139 persons in step down facilities um, there are currently 274 patients in state quarantine facilities and um, although you may not have been hearing much about repatriation exercises they continue to occur unabated we have another exercise planned on july 3rd for repatriated nationals from new york city to port of spain and as of this morning at 8 a.m there were 116 persons ticketed we also have another repatriation exercise on july 6th from toronto to trinidad and we have a planned exercise for students from Barbados on July 13th as well. Um, just to let you all know that there were some deaths um, over the last 24 hours um, that were recorded. There were 11 additional COVID-19 related deaths. The persons were six elderly males, three elderly females and two middle-aged males, all with comorbidities. This brings the total number of COVID-related deaths to 833, and we would like to express our condolences to the relatives of the deceased persons. I'd just like to provide a brief update on the parallel healthcare system and the hospitals within the parallel healthcare system. Um, so this morning, we had a net admission overnight of 24 additional patients in the parallel healthcare system. We admitted 56 persons and 32 persons were discharged. And um, that's the sort of average in terms of the net that we've been admitting over the last three days, somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 24 patients. 
Of course, in net admissions is important because it gives us a guide as to how we are to allocate our resources. Additionally, we in terms of the occupancy levels that we have um, in the parallel healthcare system, the today's occupancy overall is at 51%. Trinidad and Tobago's occupancy is 54%. And this has represented a decline or a general decline that we have been noting from or about the 1st of June 2021. It's been a very slow decline, but there has been a decline that has been noted. We also look at the percentage occupancies, that is how many beds are filled at each level of care. And at the ICU level of care, which is where our most ill patients go, those who require ventilation, they require dialysis support, um, and so on, the ICU capacity overall in Trinidad and Tobago is at 90%. But in Trinidad, 98% of our beds are filled. Um, in the HD or high dependency unit, in where our next or, or the critically ill patients are also placed, the IC, sorry, the high dependency unit capacity is currently at 59%. The ward level patients at present, uh, they, it's the overall capacity is at 48%. So at this point in time, half of our ward beds in Trinidad and Tobago are filled. In Trinidad, the ward capacity is at 52%, while at Tobago, it's at 21%. So in summary, we are seeing a general decline in the overall hospital occupancy, as well as the ward occupancy from June 1st onwards. However, the ICU and the HDU occupancies continue to be high, which indicates that we continue to see very ill patients at the HDU and ICU. And uh, that really emphasizes and underscores the point for us to continue practicing our three Ws. That is wear your mask, watch your distance and wash your hands. Now an additional layer of protection for persons um, to pr protect you know, our families, our co-workers, our neighbors and ourselves and the population is vaccination. And as of 4 p.m. yesterday, we, the Ministry of Health um, reported that 212,774 persons received their first dose of vaccines, with 80,029 persons receiving their second dose. Um, I'd like to reiterate on behalf of the Ministry of Health and to everyone that your second dose is critical. You must get your second dose within the stipulated time frame. Um, because it's only when you get that second booster dose that you will be considered to be fully vaccinated and to have that full defense against COVID-19. Additionally, please remember that it takes two weeks after your first, your second, sorry, your second vaccination dose for you to be considered fully vaccinated. And even after you've had that second dose, you need to continue to, to, to pr protect yourself and your relatives by practicing the three Ws. Uh, as, I summer, as I close off today, um, again, I want to leave everyone here on behalf of the Ministry of Health with some messages. And one is a message of gratitude and appreciation. Thank you very much to everyone who has continued to practice their three Ws. We know it has been a trying time, um, especially over the last two months, but we are confident that if we continue to practice the COVID-19 prevention measures, if we continue to work together, we will beat and win this battle against COVID-19. Again, I'd like to remind everyone to please be your neighbor's keeper. Let's all be responsible. Let's all continue to practice our three Ws as Dr. Trotman has been imploring with us from the beginning of this pandemic. And let's continue to be hopeful. Let's continue to be resilient and to persevere as we will win this fight against COVID-19. Thank you very much, Candice. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards, for that very important update for keeping us in the loop with current information and, of course, for those words of inspiration. Next, I invite uh, Dr. Amor, CEO of the SWRHA, to give us some insight into COVID-19 vaccination in South Trinidad. Good morning, Manager of Corporate Communications, Ms. Candice Alcantara, 
Dr. Miriam Abdul Richards, Principal Medical Officer Institutions, to all the healthcare workers, those employed and assigned to all our SWARA facilities, to the citizens, re residents, and others who live and work and conduct business within the Southwest Regional Health Authority's health jurisdiction, members of the media, viewing and listening public, I would like to thank very much the Ministry of Health and the organizers of the media conference for inviting the Southwest Regional Health Authority to share briefly with you the work that the SWRHA is doing on, as part of the national effort towards the COVID response. In that light, I have a brief presentation that I would like to share with the viewing and listening public. On this slide, we just would like to share with you an overview of the SWRHA in terms of its geographical location and an understanding of the size of our health work infrastructure. We serve approximately 600,000 citizens across our two major hospitals, that is the San Fernando General and Teaching Hospital, as well as the recently opened Point Fortin Hospital. We also have 33 health centers three district health facilities, that is at Kuva, Separi, and Princess Town, two extended care centers, that is at Kuva and at Point Fortin, the New Horizon facility, and we would like to indicate to the public that our staff membership stands at around 5,902. And at this first juncture, as CEO, we, I would like to personally thank the hard work, dedication, and effort of each and every staff member whether they be clinical, operations, administrative, or the executive level in dealing with the contribution to the national effort against COVID. As, as we move to the next slide, we would now like to indicate uh, the work of the SWRHA to date in terms of the vaccination program and our contribution to the national effort. As displayed, we too are involved in the administration of the Sinopharm as well as the AstraZeneca um, vaccines. In terms of the first dose Sinopharm, we have given to date 30,166 um, doses. And in terms of the follow-up second dose that allows full vaccination, we now have 12,964 persons being vaccinated across our Southwest facilities to date. Similarly, with the AstraZeneca, um, we have completed the first dose, which stands at 15,849 and the second dose of AstraZeneca, which is being conducted solely at the SAPA site in collaboration with the management team at SAPA, is 9,096. This gives a daily average um, per se of, in terms of Sinopharm, the second dose, we give an average of about 1,000 doses per day, um, a current, and at SAPA, in terms of the current regime, we give an average of about 600 doses per day that accounts for these national figures. As we move to the next slide, I would also like to indicate that we have given an average of 1,800 to 2,000 healthcare workers in the Southwest Regional Health Authority who have decided to take the vaccine at this point. This slide shows the, the vaccine throughput as it occurs across our several facilities, as I described earlier. So there are a total of 14 um, facilities that are involved in the Sinopharm administration. We have decided to demonstrate it by counties, and certainly the picture showed the healthcare workers at work in the facilities. So in County St. Patrick, we give it at the Separia District Health Facility, the Point Fortin Health Center, the Cedras Health Center, South Oropooch Health Center, and more recently, Penal Rock Road Health Center. In County Victoria, we give it at the Princess Town District Health Facility, Gasparillo Health Center, Marabella Health Center, Laramine, St. Madeline, and Moruga Health Centers. And in County Carney South, which is under Southwest County Carney, not being under the North Central Regional Health Authority, the health centers under our jurisdiction in County Carney South will be the Coover District Health Facility, the Freeport Health Center, and more recently, the Tabakit Health Center. It is a mix of urban, semi-urban, and rural communities that we are attempting to serve with the current vaccine supply to date. And as aforementioned, the Southern Academy for Performing Arts, SAPA, is involved principally in the second dose of AstraZeneca. Uh, as we go to the next slide, we would like to indicate that the vaccination in Southwest, we certainly work with the Ministry of Health to deal with issues of supply chain, customer service at the, each of these health facilities, 
the ease of workflow for both persons receiving the vaccine and the staff. And of course, we um, also pay attention to the signage at each of the facilities to ensure that everything runs smoothly. This is on our social media page that we give out daily, which depicts the data shared earlier that essentially at this time we have 20,042 fully immunized persons um, at, as of the date of that advisory on Sunday, and that the initial dose was around 46,015. And next slide. As we move to the next slide, also would like to share um, the role of the SWRH as contributes to the National Parallel Healthcare System as described by Dr. Richards. We have been mandated by the Ministry of Health to be in stewardship of these four facilities at the Augustus Long Hospital, Point Fourteen Hospital, Point Fourteen Area Hospital, and the UE Deby Academy, latter being in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and the University of the West Indies. Um, certainly would like to indicate here that the role of the Souters RHA, we, these four facilities contribute 225 beds towards the response, but as the Ministry of Health would indicate it, a bed is not a bed. So therefore, there is a network that goes on in order to ensure that all persons who are COVID positive are appropriately treated according to the severity of their illness. Um, would like to indicate that the South East Regional Health Authority is involved in our robust molecular lab testing. We have a strong primary care surveillance team that deals with persons who are not ready to be hospitalized but need to be seen at home. From there, we have a good network with the GMRTT in order to take anyone who's ill to any of our facilities. And even within our facilities, we have a strong um, ambulance inter-facility transfer system. And therefore, for each of these four facilities, there is a clinical and corporate governance structure that involves our supremely by our board, through myself, with executives. And each of these four sites would have a medical nursing and non-clinical or administrative lead that ensures that all facets of the COVID response meets the Ministry of Health standards and by extension the standards of the SWRHA. And finally, as we move on to the last slide, we also pay attention very firmly and strongly to the sanitization, infection prevention and control and the health and safety measures that need to be employed in order to manage the COVID response. And as I conclude, this will demonstrate within more recent times the over 65 years um, experience, which is a collage of all the work that is being done. And we would like to thank the population very much for accepting these vaccines, as well as the staff. And we also showed very briefly the, some of our healthcare heroes from all, um, from all levels within the organization. And on that brief note, I would like to thank you and I would hand you back over to Ms. Alcantara. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. And I saw images of so many healthcare heroes in uh, the slides that were used. Very happy to see these beautiful faces. And as we also noted, Swara is working very hard to deliver healthcare services to the population. Uh, as you know, we also take time to respond to questions that we received from the public to ensure that you have accurate information and accurate responses to your concerns directly from subject matter experts. So let's go to our first public question. First question, we have addressed this, but we see this coming back up again. Can you get COVID-19 after being fully vaccinated? I think Dr. Richards is taking this first question. Okay, thank you very much, Candice. So this is a very important question that we, that um, the, ourselves, like, persons like as myself, such as the physicians, really have been asked repeatedly. And um, the short answer is yes, there have been few, a few cases of fully vaccinated persons contracting the COVID-19 virus. However, I must say it is extremely rare. So I would like to reiterate, it is possible, but it is extremely rare. And it is important to note, however, that by and large, the benefits of vaccination greatly outweigh the risks associated with it. And the benefit in terms of vaccination and prevention of COVID-19, prevention of the complications of COVID-19 that can have a person end up in, uh, for example, the ICU or the HD units or even the regular wards in the hospital are greatly decreased if one is vaccinated. The Ministry of Health continues to recommend that if you are fully vaccinated and you 
acquire certain symptoms that are similar to those of COVID-19, for example, um, runny nose, fever, dry cough, and tiredness, then um, you should be tested for COVID-19. So please contact your physician if you, if you have start experiencing these symptoms in spite of being vaccinated. Of course, once again, continue to practice the three W's, please. Um, even if you are vaccinated, it does not mean that you can stop wearing your mask or, or start, you know, commingling in, in, a, in, a, in a closer space and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. And we also have the benefit of having Dr. Amor with us. So he's going to take the second question. Um, very simple question. Is a runny nose a symptom of COVID-19? Morning again. Thanks for the question. Runny nose in itself is not a specific or diagnostic symptom that suggests COVID, to be clear. Um, certainly, if you have any symptoms, you should seek medical attention. In the context of COVID, we would like to remind the public um, more common symptoms, as Dr. Richards says, of fever, dry cough, um, tiredness, also loss of taste and smell. Um, those symptoms must be taken in context in terms of your also your level of exposure to anyone who may have had COVID or if you have found yourself not to be practicing the three W's. So runny nose in of itself is not a specific or a diagnostic symptom of COVID. It's the other symptoms described. And also once you seek medical attention based on your exposure risk, then it would indicate to the medical fraternity whether or not you would then undergo testing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. And the final question from the public this morning. We see this question coming up again. We will answer it again and reconfirm. The question is, can I get COVID-19 from the vaccine? And we clarify, can I get COVID-19 from the COVID-19 vaccine? We go to Dr. Richards for a response. Thank you, Candice. So no, you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine. The COVID-19 vaccine is designed to provoke or to initiate what is called an immune response um, so that your body is now equipped to attack, attack the virus and to fight off infections. I would like to reiterate that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe and effective in preventing you from acquiring COVID-19 or being infected with COVID-19 and it also protects the persons around you. Um, and of course, we are looking, working towards our goal of herd immunity in this manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. And there you got some very clear, simple responses to questions that we see being repeated um, in the public domain about COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine. And we go now to field questions from the media. Media representatives, as is customary, please indicate your name and the media house that you represent before posing two brief questions. Please ask both press questions at the same time and emphasis, is, emphasis please on brief. Of course, if we have extra time, we will come back to you. Our first questions this morning come from 98.1. Are we ready with 98.1? Okay, so we will move to the next uh, in line and we'll probably come back to 98.1 after. We'll go to 103.1. Hi, good morning. I'm not sure you all hear me clearly. Uh, my question is, how far along are we with vaccinating those who are at risk and in the elderly population? And if more, when more vaccines reach, which groups outside of these current groups will be targeted um, for the vaccine? Thank you very much. Dr. Richards, I think, um, will respond to this question, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are presently um, confirming the actual number of persons under phase one who have been vaccinated, and the Ministry of Health and the CMO will be very pleased to give that actual figure in terms of the persons who are over 65 and are vaccinating. Of course, the priority right now has been on the vaccination of the elderly and the persons over 65, as well as other groups that are considered essential. Uh, when vaccines become, uh, when more vaccines become available, um, and we should have um, some confirmation and announcement soon from the Honourable Minister and Prime Minister on this, uh, we will be targeting 
other groups. So for example, there would be vulnerable populations such as the persons who are disabled and um, we'd be moving into, we've already started and have been moving into the elderly homes and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Next in line, IETV, please. Hi. Hi, good morning. Bina Mahi is ITV News. I have two questions. My first question, uh, perhaps would we'll go to Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, when the borders are opened next month, are we able to handle potential surges of the virus with our current resources? And um, my second question would perhaps go to um, Dr. Amor. Um, last week, I believe, Dr., a situation occurred where a pregnant woman um, she was pregnant with twins. She was hospitalized at the Point Fortin Hospital and there was no gynecologist or specialist there and she was transferred. And I understand uh, the babies were born preterm. Can we have an update in that situation? And are measures being implemented to have specialists on site for situations such like these? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mahes. I'll take the first part of the question um, in which you are seeking confirmation on the ability of the parallel healthcare system to manage a potential surge in cases due to the reopening of the borders. Now, the border control and the policies around the reopening of the borders have been very stringent as they have been identified by the Honorable Prime Minister and all measures are being taken to reduce the risk of COVID positive persons entering Trinidad and Tobago. And really that reason, that, that justification is, re is essential in order to reduce the burden on the parallel healthcare system. Notwithstanding that, the parallel healthcare system currently has a capacity of over 1,000 beds, approximately 1,022 beds across 16 facilities, of which 14 are in Trinidad and Tobago. And in the event of a surge, and as we saw previously um, over between the, the end of April into May, the parallel healthcare system will be resilient and can manage any additional cases of COVID-19 that require hospitalization and further care. I'll pass on now to Dr. Amo for the second part of the question. Good morning, thank you for the question. Um, just for clarification, the, the the issue with the pregnant mom and her unborn twins at the time, and that, that case occurred at Augustus Long Hospital. Um, the clinical update, as stated in the public domain, um, the pregnant mom did go to Augustus Long Hospital, um, had to be transferred back to San Fernando General Hospital to, to have the delivery done as per the protocol. And um, the two babies were critically ill, and one of the twins um, has unfortunately passed away. And we would like to take this opportunity to express condolences and to both mother and father and, and, and her family at this time. The matter is undergoing the, the customary investigation in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. Um, apart from this specific case, um, the general management for pregnant mothers does follow national guidelines. Um, Decisions are made by the clinical experts on the field, both in Augustus Lung and Infectious Disease, as well as the obstetricians. And the general principles are looking firstly and foremost at the maternal health and well-being. So for a pregnant mother having COVID, we have to take care of the mommy first, so to speak. And therefore, decisions are made in that regard. And thereafter, any issue that relates to the unborn baby or any issue that relates to delivery, then a separate clinical decision is made in order to ensure a safe and healthy delivery, which at this time will occur at the San Fernando General Hospital. So that's the general principles of management, but the specific case raise is being investigated and that all um, protocols are followed both in the regular system and the parallel healthcare system at this time. Thank you very much. I think Dr. Richards had some additional information to add in relation to the first question. So I was speaking um, generally, and the question that Ms. Mahe posed was on the parallel healthcare system's ability to respond to a surge. But I'd like to remind members of the population that the responsibility and personal responsibility in terms of doing your part to reduce the spread of COVID-19 when we open, reopen borders on July 17th is essential. We need to continue to follow all guidelines that the Ministry of Health have put in place and um, that we continuously remind everyone to follow. That is the three W's, wash your hands, 
watch your distance and wear your mask. And also we would like to continue to encourage everyone to continue following the COVID-19, um, the public health regulations as they pertain to COVID-19. And also please, if you are in that group that is eligible for vaccination, please accept your vaccine. And if you require a second dose, please ensure that you keep your second dose appointments. We are confident that if we practice all of these measures as a population and we have the parallel healthcare system to manage anyone who requires hospital care, the border reopening process will be a seamless one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Richards. We all have a part to play in the management of COVID-19. We go to AZP News now, please. Hi, good morning, Priya Bihari, azpnews.com. My question is about the, the Delta variant. Um, are the symptoms of the Delta variants any different from the Gamma variant or, or, or any of the variants or of the COVID-19? And are there any suspected or confirmed cases of the Delta variant in Trinidad and Tobago at this point in time? Thank you. Okay, so I'll take that question. Thank you, Pryor. Um, the symptoms of the Delta variant are similar to all other variants. So once um, a person or an individual has any of those suspect symptoms, um, the common and the less common symptoms, they are advised to immediately seek medical attention, 800-WELL or 877-WELL. And at this point in time, there are no confirmed cases of the Delta variant in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Guardian Media Limited, CNC3, please. Sorry, for some reason, we can't hear Mr. Khan at this time. Hi, morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so my two questions are this morning. Firstly, um, we've heard a lot about the importance of taking that second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, Dr. Richards or even uh, Dr. Moore, can you give us an idea of how many people, if any, at this time have missed or did not turn up to get their second dose of a, a, a vaccine? And my second question, Dr. Richards, um, you mentioned that the public, the parallel healthcare system is at around 51% capacity. Now, I'm just wondering, are there any plans for in the near future to probably remove some of these facilities within that system, for instance, like the Point Fourteen Hospital or even the Arima one, so that it could serve the people of those communities. Thank you very much, Dr. Amora. I think can give us a good indication of at least what's happening in Southwest with uh, default as per the second dose of the vaccine. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, the short answer is that due to the um, desire for the uptake, our default rate is practically nil. Um, however, it is still a standard risk for any vaccination program. So therefore, we certainly have contact information for persons. I remind the public that there is a range of, of period over which we give the second dose. The, go the government and the RHAs are taking the lower limit. So for example, AstraZeneca is between 8 to 12 weeks, Sinopharm between 3 to 4 weeks. So we are certainly giving at the least possible um, interval. So therefore, what we do is that we have a list of persons that we expect on a given day for the second dose and at the end of every day or even during the day if a person on the list identified does not show up at the appointed time we do have um, follow-up call mechanisms and we also have the ability to take persons if even they miss their their dose on a given day to call them to come back in on a follow-up day but what what we have found as i said in the beginning is that practically everyone is turning back up for their second dose um, when they are called. And we also say for the second dose, AstraZeneca in particular, even for the second dose, Sinopharm, when you get your first dose, there is the, your counsel as to the time when you have to come back for your second dose, more so for the Sinopharm. It's also written at, at the back of your immunization card. And certainly with respect to the AstraZeneca, we would have called everyone, all 15,000 persons, as far as, as the contact information allowed. And if even we, you have not been reached with a call, we have advertised the available dates and you can still call to make inquiries. So with the systems in place and with the results on the ground, um, the default rate is very, very minimal to practically none thus far for the Southwest RHA. So I'll take the second um, part of the question that was posed regarding the 
utilization of hospitals within the parallel healthcare system. So at present, there are 16 hospitals and step-down facilities in the parallel healthcare system that are in use for ill confirmed COVID positive patients. And of those 16, 14 are in Trinidad and Tobago and two, 14 are in Trinidad and two are in Tobago. Nine of the 16 institutions or facilities are for critically ill patients or hospital level care as we would see. As of this morning, even though the overall occupancy is 51%, as of this morning, only one of the nine hospitals uh, is over the threshold of 75%, and that is the Arim, um, Augustus Long Hospital, which is currently at 91%. In the seven step-down facilities, only one right now is above the 75% threshold, which is the Point Fortin and the area hospital Point Fortin. So we are seeing an improvement. This is the first time that we've noted this um, this week since um, the latest wave and when we started seeing that increased number of cases in April of 2021. Richard, your question really was regarding the transitioning back of hospitals within the parallel healthcare system to the traditional system. And that's a policy decision that will be taken by the Honorable Minister of Health. And it really would be based on the need for the hospital beds and um, looking at the caseload and so on. So at this point in time, I cannot provide confirmation on hospitals being returned to the traditional healthcare system. We have only just started seeing a decline over the last two weeks in the hospital occupancy numbers. Um, however, um, we can look forward to an update on that when numbers, when the hospital occupancy numbers come down to a much lower rate. And of course, it would be a decision made by the Honourable um, Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go now to TV6, please. Are we ready with TV6? Hi, good morning. Alessia Boucher from TV6. Um, my question the first question goes to Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, I know that we usually transition based on a need um, between ICU and HDU bed space. Given that you have stated that the ICU capacity in Trinidad, I believe you stated that it's 98% at this time, I wanted to find out whether there are any plans to transition um, some of these beds to ICU beds and what capacity do we have in terms of um, space to, you know, well, overall space to transition these beds. Um, that, so, so that's my first question. The second question is for Dr. Amor. Dr. Amor, can you give us um, an average response time for the GMR TT services in the SWRA, under the SWRA chain? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ms. Boucher. That's an excellent question um, that you've posed regarding the transitioning of beds. So at present, we are at 98%, meaning almost all the existing ICU beds and the relevant equipment, staffing and personnel are being used in Trinidad and Tobago. And yes, we do have capacity to upscale ward level beds or HDU level beds to ICU level beds. Uh, we do still have possibly about 20 to 30 ventilators in storage that can be commissioned and used immediately. So as required and based on demand, we can convert a ward level bed uh, to or a ward, a ward area with you know low, a lower level or lower acuity of care, as we say in medicine, to an ICU level bed. For that conversion, of course, there is the physical space that is required, which is available in the relevant hospitals. We would also need to ensure that there is the additional staffing and the, 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 the class of staff that we would need in terms of ICU doctors, ICU nurses, and, um, and other persons who support ICU patient, cares, patient care. There's also the need for the ventilators, the monitors that go along with the bed, um, what other equipment such as syringe pumps and infusion pumps and I can confirm that all of these um, equipment and staffing is available if we needed to convert and transition beds and this has been an ongoing process um, throughout this most recent um, upsurge in cases that we have been doing um, consistently so yes there is capacity 
both on a physical level, a human resource level, and an equipment level to really convert a ward level bed to an ICU bed, you know, based on that discussion that we have, that has been ongoing, that a bed is not a bed. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we go to Dr. Amor for response to the second question, please. Morning. Thank you for the question. Um, with respect to the GMRTT, um, that is a national service provider um, that, that works with the direction from the um, Ministry of Health, um, but certainly in terms of the interface with the SWRHA, um, the, the times, um, it has been stated in the national average, um, on average from the time of a call for a patient to the GMRTT, um, at the peak around mid-May or so, um, there, there, there were, there, there, there were um, tra tra challenges initially with respect to the, the times, but now as we come to the end of June, um, it, it has gotten more manageable, at least from the perspective of the SWRHA. So patients, um, if they are in distress, they call and the ambulance comes and certainly brings them to the Southwest facility um, in a timely manner. From our data, we get an average of about 10 to 15 um, transfers from home to the to the Southwest facilities. And what I would like to indicate to the public is that at the SWRHA, we are now responsible for what we call inter-facility transfers. So there was at one point where the GMRTT would have been sending persons to the point 14 hospital um, because they, they had a lot of capacity to, to intake patients. And certainly now, as Dr. Richard says, as the occupancy levels has dropped, we now have GMRTT directing COVID positive patients from home to two facilities. San Fernando General Hospital Emergency Department and also to when indicated the Point 14 Hospital. And from there, we do have our own fleet system that allows smooth transfer to any one of the four facilities and noting that the facilities themselves are either um, for full level critical care or step down. We have the ability to transfer patients efficiently between, let us say, the Augusta Long or Point 14 Hospital to Davis step down or area hospital or vice versa. So therefore that is also part of the ambulance transfer system, but that is um, indigenous to Southwest as distinct from the GMRTT. Thank you very much. We go now to Newsday. We are ready for your questions. Good morning, Narissa Fraser from the Newsday. My two questions are for Dr. Moore actually. Um, the first question, I saw that the uh, psychiatric outpatient clinic is returning to the area hospital in Point Forte. And I know that is a special facility for COVID-19 patients, so I wanted to find out how that is going to work. Uh, the second question is regarding the state of the extended care facility in that area as well. I'm um, sure you would have seen some reports that are saying that have been rodent infestations and snakes and other things for the past few years. And I wanted a response on that. Thanks. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Yeah. Moore. Okay, Th thank you for the two questions. With respect to the area hostile point 14 and the relocation of the psychiatric clinic, um, yes, that is so. Um, we initially had it at the point 14 extended care center and beginning tomorrow, we would put the psychiatric outpatient clinic services at the area hostel point 14. The part of the area hospital that is being used to manage COVID patients is just one part of a fairly large plant, um, property plant. So therefore, there's a totally distinct area for entrance and exit, and certainly the appropriate signage and so forth will be there. So therefore, that, that is a totally separate part of the uh, what we would consider area hospital point 14 that will not at all be related to where the active quote-unquote hot zone area is. So it is a pretty big facility in of itself. With respect to the um, complaints in the public domain, we would have indicated to the national reading public um, the circumstances surrounding that facility. Um, in essence, it, it has always been part of a larger infrastructural upgrade that SOUTERS has undertaken even during COVID. So in short, the plans that we had was that at the commissioning of the new Point 14 hospital, the services of the old area hospital would have been transferred, which did occur in March. And then we were intent on doing refurbishment works at the area hospital point 14 so that we could in turn take the patients from and staff and services from the point 14 extended care center. As, as, as I would like the public to appreciate in, in, in general times, that facility houses persons um, that are elderly as well as persons with some of them with underlying mental health issues. So therefore care and attention 
has to be taken if you're relocating any service in order to effect repairs. So that was the plan, and as stated in the public domain, based on the emergency situation, the area of Hospital Point Fortin was refurbished, but it has been used now for um, treatment of COVID patients. So therefore, the plans that we had have been relatively halted. Um, notwithstanding saying that, uh, we have listened to the public and to the patients and to the staff. So we are still relooking at the entire situation and certainly we would advise the staff as to what plans we would have um, in the near future to treat with some minor issues, relatively minor, but the facility in of itself is planned for major upgrade works. It just has been temporarily halted due to COVID. Um, so it was in the planning and we have kept these persons and our staff there in mind and um, rest assured we will continue to treat with the matter um, in the shortest possible time as circumstances allow. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Radio Tambrin, please. Radio Tambrin, I see that you're there and ready. I don't know if there's a technical issue. Are we ready to go with Radio Tambrin now? Okay, as soon as we sort that out, we will come back to you, please, Radio Tambrin. Let's go to a follow-up question from 103.1 FM, please. Hi, good morning again. My question is a follow-up as well from Richard's question about second doses. What I want to know is, given the feedback on how persons have been coming back out for their second dose, can you um, tell me how well on track is the ministry for the end of July target of 188,900 fully vaccinated persons. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Yes, um, I can confirm that the Ministry of Health is well on its target um, for the, the 180,000 fully vaccinated persons. Um, and as at 4 p.m. of yesterday, we had a total of 80,029 persons who have been fully vaccinated, and that is persons who have received their second dose. Um, the Ministry of Health continues to work with the RHAs who have been delivering the vaccine, as well as several private stakeholders um, who have been providing immense support to the national effort to ensure that this target will be met. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let's try Radio Tambrin again. Are we ready for Mr. Clark? Okay, so let's go to AZP News, please. We will try to sort things out um, for Radio Tambrin. Let's go to AZP News for a follow-up question. Hi, good morning again. Prior Bihari, AZP News. Uh, I just wanted to find out when, when you get your, your second dose of the vaccine, is that good enough until a year or, or is that good enough um, forever? Because, you know, with... With the flu vaccine, for example, you know it um, it is a yearly vaccine. So, so what what is the learning and the thinking and the policy with with the COVID nineteen vaccine right now? Thank you. Thanks, Prior. The COVID nineteen virus is a new virus, and um, at this point in time, there isn't sufficient information available as per the WHO as to how long the vaccine would be effective for. But there's a minimum of of on or around eight to nine months going to a year in terms of how effective this the length of time that the vaccine would be effective for. However, the Ministry of Health is guided by the WHO recommendations and, and um, the guidelines that are put forth, and we will continue to provide information once that confirmed timeline per vaccine has been confirmed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think I see a follow-up question from Newsday, is it? Can we have the follow-up question from Newsday, please? Hi, again. Um, this one is also to Dr. Amor. Some people have been asking about um, surgeries or being turned away for surgeries rather in Southwest. Um, someone who is speaking about gallbladder surgery is saying that they're saying that's not an emergency and that the person should go and do it privately, which apparently is over $40,000. Um, they wanted to find out, I guess, for you to differentiate between what would be an emergency surgery and what wouldn't be. Thank you. We go to Dr. Moore. Um, thank you for the question. Um, 
that that particular query did come to my attention um, late last night. Um, what I would like to say is that um, the surgeries have been continuing in all RHAs, including the Southwest RHA. All emergency surgeries are done. Um, elective surgeries, elective meaning surgeries that uh, that based on the joint decision of the patient and the doctor that we can afford to do non-surgical interventions in waiting for the definitive surgery, well, that is on a scheduled list. Um, certainly, um, I would be happy to take more information for the person. Um, as I said, I did get the individual complaint, so I have forwarded it to the um, quality department. And therefore, um, any complaints of that nature, we encourage persons to call 87 Swara or to check the quality department. And also, too, it, would, it is always useful to um, have in your possession the date of schedule of your surgery, because that is an internal mandate from the SWRHA, all patients who are scheduled for surgeries, and uh, whether um, mostly elective surgeries, um, are to be given a date, and from their discussions can be had in terms of treating with the underlying condition um, requiring the surgery. So I would be I would commit to look into the matter further. Thank you very much, CEO. Let's go to TV6 now for a follow-up question, please. Hi again. My question goes out to Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, we are seeing what's happening in India with the outbreak of mucomycosis, which is a rare fungal infection linked to the COVID-19 um, virus, as well as the use of corticosteroids um, in the treatment of the COVID-19 virus. Now, that fungus has a mortality rate of 50%. And on June 11th, PAHO would have issued a statement urging member states to prepare health services in order to minimize morbidity and mortality. Now, have we seen any cases of mucomycosis in TNT? And if not, what are we doing to prep for that eventuality? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the short answer is, that, is at as of this time, we have not seen any cases of mucomycosis, which as you, you identified is a recognized side effect or complication of corticosteroid use. And of course, corticosteroid use is part of the supportive treatment for COVID-19 patients, especially those who are in the ICU. Now, in terms of our preparation, um, this is a known side effect, and we do have um, systems in place to mitigate in the event of a person having or a person contracting um, mucomycosis. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that Dr. Michelle Trotman, who, who leads the national um, clinical response to COVID-19 at the hospital level, um, we do have meetings in terms of mortality and morbidity, and we do discuss on a daily basis the cases that we would have seen and any particular complications or concerns. So we are well equipped to manage any cases of mucomycosis if we encounter them. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Unfortunately, we were not able to address the connectivity issues with Radio Tambrin, but of course, we invite you to send your questions to the Ministry of Health's Corporate Communication Unit. And we have come to the end of this morning's virtual media conference. And we have reached this far and the management of COVID-19 because of our collective efforts. One of the themes of today's presentation was gratitude. And aligning to that theme, today I want to thank the volunteers who are working very hard at our vaccination sites. This is encouraging for us, especially for our healthcare workers who have been on the ground doing the work for more than a year. The energy that our volunteers have infused into the system and the assistance that they provide, it's really a demonstration of the collaborative approach that we need to overcome this pandemic. To our healthcare workers, to our partners from other entities, the policemen, those from Air Guard, Coast Guard, to our volunteers, to the private sector that works with us in the PPP arrangements, we thank you today. And remember, health is everyone's business. So stay home if you don't need to go out. And please, wear your mask. Have a good day.
has been running smoothly uh, since the beginning and we can expect that it will continue to run smoothly and we will achieve our target. So our goal, fully vaccinated by July 2021, is 188,900. Right, so we are on stream to achieve our targets by July, to have over 10% of the population fully vaccinated. I am taking the vaccine for myself and my son who disabled at home. My aunt is 67, 87 years and she take the vaccine. They don't know where it will pick up outside. My mother turned 90 next week, so I need to be protected to protect her from the virus because we all know that elderly people are being